for your presence this morning. <clears throat> and as Ann already said, we're happy to have visitors with us and hope that you'll see fit to come back at every opportunity you have. Be opening your Bibles, please, to Exodus chapter 3. And we'll be examining things all the way through that chapter and into verse 17 of chapter 4. Exodus 3, verse 1 through chapter 4, 17. We'll come back to that in a moment. When God appeared to Moses at the burning bush, which would not be consumed by the fire, he called him at that time to lead the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. Then follows a very interesting study because in response... Moses gave God excuses as to why he did not think that he was the man for the job. Now we recognize that this is a part of what all of us tend to do if we do not watch out, if we are not careful. The excuses of Moses and God's response to him as he offered those excuses will then serve as the basis of our study in this sermon this morning. As I say, the reason for that is, in a similar way, God's people today have received a special calling. First, when we heard the gospel, we understood it, and from the heart we obeyed it to become Christians, those who are of Christ, members of the Lord's church. Now, we've been called not to deliver anybody from another country from physical bondage as was Moses. But we have a command that belongs to the church and that is to preach the gospel to every creature for it's God's power to save, Romans 1, 16, also Mark 16, 15. We're interested in people being forgiven of their sins, being reconciled to God, justified in His sight and faithful members of the church, for he adds all those who are baptized into Christ for the remission of sins to his church, Acts 2, 38 and 47. We also, as members of the church, as Christians, need to be reminded about who we really are. And when we obeyed the gospel, what that meant in our conversion, in the true sense of the word conversion. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, meaning a people for his own possessions, purchased by the blood of Christ, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Too often, though, we behave like Moses, and we often make the very same excuses to God that he does. I'd like for us to begin by reading the first ten verses of Exodus chapter 3. Now, I know we're familiar with this, or at least most of us are, but this is dealing with the call that God gave to Moses concerning what we know him for. Now, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back side of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, 
the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, under the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold the cry of the children of Israel is coming to me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now that seems simple. I don't think it's difficult for any of us to understand what God is asking Moses to do. He selected him. God is all-knowing. He, know all, he knows all there is about Moses. He understands his background. He knows him through and through and through. But then I want us to notice what happens as soon as these words of God are uttered to Moses. Verse 11, And Moses said unto God, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? Though he had been of the royal ruling house of Egypt and that for approximately 40 years. He had been 40 years now a lowly shepherd in the land of Midian. He's an 80-year-old man. Already past the average lifespan for that particular generation. I've often wondered, did he say, can't you find a younger man for the job? Where would you find a man for this job who had the knowledge and the experience and the understanding that he would have, listen, that only comes with years of experience? Where would he go? Not only this, doesn't Moses know that God knows all things? And that before he ever approached him, that he understood Moses was the man for the job? And if God thinks you are the man or woman for the job, do you think he doesn't know what he's talking about or thinking about or how to make choices? Now, God's response was quick. And that should have been adequate if he had not already said enough. Because in verse 12, he says, I will surely be with you. I will surely be with you. Well, this promise alone should have been sufficient for Moses. In fact, later in the New Testament, the inspired apostle Paul wrote in Romans 8, 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, some use the same excuse today. We try to excuse ourselves by believing that we are insufficient for the task. If we were acting also, we would be insufficient if it were by ourselves we were acting. If God didn't have any hand in it. If God had nothing to do with it. But God can make us sufficient for the job he's called us to do. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Paul wrote, Now that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, or not that we were, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. And there he contrasts the law of Moses with the gospel system. God makes us sufficient. Think about your own life. So many times we want to do what we're not capable of doing, and we won't do what we're capable of doing. Have you ever noticed that about the children of Israel? When the spies were sent out by Moses... Caleb and Joshua said, we're well able to go. God's with us. We can take that land. But then there were the ten other spies who were weak in faith. 
And thus the condemnation of God comes upon them. And all of those 20 years old and upward, besides Joshua and Caleb, would perish in the wilderness because of their sins. Well, when they heard that, then the ten spies and all the rest who had rejected said, we'll go up and take the land. God says, no, don't go. Or rather Moses does because God hasn't told you to go. But they went anyway. Here they wouldn't go when God said go. But now he says, this is what's going to happen to you. So they're ready to go. Does that sound like anybody you know, possibly, in your family? or in your neighbors, or even in your brethren in the church, and maybe us sometimes. Look what he did with the apostles. What formal education did they have? How trained were they according to the attainments of men? Acts 4.13 makes it clear that those apostles were not considered to be people of letters. The only one that would compare would be he who was born out of due season is an apostle, and that would be Paul, as far as a man of letters. The rest were fishermen, lowly people, people that didn't get good educations as the day had to offer. Through Jesus, God has provided us the same assurance that he gave to Moses. In Matthew's account of the Great Commission, he ends it by saying, And lo, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. He's like that toward all his children who are faithful to him. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. What he expects of us is action based upon our faith, which faith is always formed by the will of God, the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And God's always with us when we do that. That means we walk as the word of God leads, guides, and directs us. That's all we need to know, that we're commissioned of God to do whatever it is he wants us to do, and so we're ready to do it. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, command, and I will obey. That wasn't in Moses at this time. But we do learn with God's help we can accomplish anything he wants us to do. Paul wrote to the Philippians, in chapter 413, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So many times, members of the church, because they have never tried this, well, I can't do that. I can't do that. It would really be better if we'd be honest and say, you've asked me to do something I don't want to do and I'm not going to do it. <laughs> As will be apparent later, any excuse for not doing what the Lord has called us to do is simply our own deceptive smoke screen. And so it was that Moses quickly came up with another excuse. What shall I say? Exodus 3 and verse 13. Moses knew that in going to the children of Israel there were going to be questions. You don't engage in anything since the church is a teaching institution fundamentally without expecting people to ask questions. In fact, wouldn't you like for people when we're knocking doors and you introduce yourself to say, I would like to ask some questions about the church of Christ. I would love to hear that. Some of us don't want to face those questions. And there's a reason for it, maybe more than one reason. But at least one, we don't know enough about the Bible to give an answer. And there's a reason for that. We don't spend much time with it. Notice that he would face this question. Who is this God who sent you to us? Now Moses is expressing an inadequacy in knowing what to say. I read a thing the other day from a student who was asking a professor, how can I train my mind to be ready to answer folks? For I'm commanded, be ready to give an answer and make a defense. Be ready to give an answer to every man that asketh you of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. So Peter instructed every one of us as a member of the church. And it was interesting to see what the professor said. He said, well, it simply comes down to spending a lot of time with the information, studying it, studying others who have been very apt and experienced in answering it, making it a part of your practice study every day, and these things you will grow into. And that's true. Again, God is with us. He's not going to ask of us to do something he knows we're incapable of doing. Now God's response to Moses for this excuse, what shall I say, 
was immediate in Exodus 3, 14 and 15. Notice he says, thus you shall say. In other words, God is our source of information. I called you to do this. I'll not leave you hanging. I will give you the wherewithal to do what you need. No wonder then today with the completed revelation of God's will we are instructed, instructed to study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be shamed. Rightly dividing or handling aright the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 How often are we taught throughout the scriptures to study and study and study? God tells Moses what he needs to say then in response to any questions that might be put to him. Again, a similar excuse is sometimes given today. We try to excuse ourselves by saying, well, I, I just don't know enough. No, you never will if you let that stay out there. Uh, you need to put yourselves into positions where you will have to know enough. It's, that's what we won't do. But you need to put yourself into a position where you have to study to give the answer. God has told us what to say. If we really want to do something, and that's where the problem was with Moses at this time, then whatever it is becomes much easier. And what do we have in Mark 16, 15, and 16? Our Lord saying, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Many times because we understand something and we don't want to do it, then in time we come up with all of these excuses and the truth we learned that if we'd responded to it as soon as we learned it becomes vague to us because of our own stubborn will. When you look at the gospel system, Paul summed it all up when he wrote to the Corinthians and reminded them of what they had done in becoming Christians in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now notice this is a reminder. He says in the first four verses, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Well, what did he preach to? And notice you'll have to go to Harvard, Yale, Oxford, and uh, whatever else to be able to understand this. He says, by which also you're saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. That is, your belief has been pointless. You haven't continued on. Well, what? What was it he, he delivered? He says, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, just stop right there. What do people need to know in order for them to become Christians? Well, there are a number of things, but it all fundamentally comes down to Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Then he says, I also preached that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, and notice, according to the Scriptures. And then he pointed out, here's the evidence, that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep, that is, they've died. After that, he was seen of James and all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. The evidence is in. The witnesses that experienced Christ with their flesh, if you please, their five senses, saw all these things. And I'm here to tell you. All right, but that was 2,000 years ago. How do you know all of that? Well, how would you disprove that they didn't tell the truth? They have affirmed these things. We today preach what they affirmed. We proclaim Christ and Him crucified according to the Scriptures. And that's what we're to do. How can a person consider himself or herself a faithful member of the Lord's church and all the New Testament says that means and you can't even know this? There's the beginning point. A lot could be said about this. It could be built upon. But there is the skeleton outline of the truth of the gospel Paul preached to the Corinthians. But we find reasons uh, opportunities come our way we get invited to do things and we figure out how to get out of it and I'm faithful I'm exercising my talents what it really means sometimes is I'll do it if I can do it just like I want it when I think I want it and I don't have anybody bother me in other words the church is wonderful it wasn't for the people well people are at different degrees of growth and development and knowledge yet there are brothers and sisters in Christ 
and opportunities come our way to teach them. And the church, we will admit, is primarily a teaching institution. But we don't exercise our talents to do what God said us to do. And we're right back where Moses was at this time. Well, he comes up with a third objection. Suppose they won't believe me. Well, do declare. If I'd had that view, I would have quit preaching before I started. I never did. I can't. And I was in all honesty. I cannot remember a time as a preacher of the gospel of Christ that I thought, I don't want to preach. They won't believe me. I just don't remember that. I'm not trying to say I'm better than Moses. I'm just simply saying, what a thought. I won't preach unless everybody that hears me will obey the gospel or else if they're unfaithful, they'll repent. I'm just not going to preach till they do that. Can you find that in your New Testament regarding what you're to do as a teacher and when you're to do it? This is an excuse that's found in Exodus 4.1. So you see, now that he knows what to say, he balks at the idea that the people may not listen. <laughs> well, we wish they would listen better than they do. And when they understand it, we wish they would immediately respond to the gospel invitation and obey it. Or if they have become Christians and fallen away, they would repent and come back. Or they are of the disposition that I can only do things that suit me when I get ready. Now, Moses knows what to say. God has said, I'll be with you. A question, how can he fail? How could Moses fail? Surely he had not so quickly forgotten that God will be with him. Well, God responds to Moses, and we'll sum it up very quickly, by equipping him with several convincing proofs. There's the rod, which turns into a serpent, verses 2 and 5 of Exodus 4. His own hand, which turns into leprosy, Exodus 4, 6 through 8, and then the leprosy's gone, all by a miracle. And then the water, which will turn to blood when dropped on the ground, Exodus 4 and verse 9. What is God saying to him? I'm with you. Take me at my word. I am God. And I've chosen you. Some hesitate to teach the gospel for the same reason. They have a fear of failure, a fear of something. You know, we used to call rabid dogs, they had hydrophobia. Because one of the things about a dog with, uh, that is rabid, has rabies, is that it fears water. So they just called it, had hydrophobia. But ask yourself the question, what kind of phobia do you have when God is telling you, I'm with you? You're one of my children? You're the elect of the earth? You have been commissioned according to your several abilities to teach the truth, to defend the faith. And yet, we make excuses. But just as God gave Moses convincing proofs, well, guess what? He's given us evidence is necessary to convince any honest, and I underscore that, and sincere person. The Word of God is the source of faith, Romans 10, 17. You think of uh, what John wrote in John 20, 30, and 31. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Now listen, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that in believing you have life through his name. Especially its evidence is concerning the resurrection of Christ, the prophecy Christ fulfilled in his life, and you could go on and on. Now, with such aids, we cannot justify our failure to teach the gospel or be at work and the other things the church needs to do that centers around that central root reason, that is, to live the Christian life, to be righteous in our living, to edify the church, to be mindful of benevolent work. There's room for everybody in his talents and growth and development Would we have accepted the call? Well, he didn't necessarily at this point. And he comes up with another excuse. I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. This is found in Exodus 4 and verse 10. I'm not an eloquent speaker. 
But God is certainly not persuaded to turn him down to say, all right, go on about your business by this objection. You know, he already knows our inabilities. He already knows that. He knows that when the gospel first comes to us and we believe and obey it. But God is able to make up for anyone's shortcomings if there is first a willing mind <coughs> based upon his faith in God through the word of God. And again here in verse 12, he promises to be with Moses. Now here's a very interesting thing. You know, God knew Moses would make these excuses when he first came to him. I know that, first of all, because I know what omniscience means, and that means that he knows all that's the object of knowledge. He knows all that's knowable. But have you ever noticed this in Exodus 4, 14 through 16? God had already arranged for Aaron to be Moses' mouthpiece. Now, what does that mean? Well, from Exodus 4, 27, I learned that Aaron had been sent earlier so he would arrive at about this time so he would be there when Moses made the excuse. He would say, there's Aaron. If you can't talk, he can. God said he would be with him. And the God we serve knows our every thought, motive, and action, and intent of the heart and what we're going to do all our lives. He knows what we're able to do. And when he calls on us, we can do it. Some church members try to use this excuse as well. But you know, that didn't stop the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he confessed to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 1, and then we'll look at 3 and 4. Because it pertains directly, these three verses pertain directly to this. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring the testimony of God, then he says, beginning verse 3, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power. As an apostle of Christ, of course, he had those powers to testify and the Spirit would allow him to work miracles. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 12. He says to the Corinthians, that truly the signs of an apostle wrought among you. But he still was a human being. And I was with you in all these things characteristic of human beings who are converted to Christ and determined to live righteous in an ungodly world. And this has not stopped others. I, I know and I'm thinking of one preacher now who overcame speech impediments to, to, to be a preacher of the gospel. I know one who despite all kinds of stammering problems would preach any opportunity he could. You can overcome things. You can get better, but you don't do it without stepping out and trying. At the very least, we can make use of those who can speak by arranging studies for them with others. Think of Cornelius and his conversion. Think about that whole thing. Acts 10, 24 and 33. Now, we've, in, we've studied these excuses as smoke screens that Moses gave. But the true reason, I've already said several times, for all these smoke screens or excuses is revealed in Exodus chapter 4, verse 13. Please send whomever else you may send. You know what he's saying? I don't want to go. Send somebody else. How often have elders in every congregation I've been in called on the elect of the world, the members of the church, to do certain things? No. No. And many times they come up with an excuse or their smoke screen because sometimes they just won't say outright, no, I don't want to do it. Get somebody else. Sometimes you might some, find somebody that way, but most of the time they do like Moses. And it didn't start with Moses. We've been studying Genesis. Do you remember the situation with Adam and Eve after they had sinned? You remember what Adam said? Who he blamed the sin on? Ultimately, he blamed it on God. 
Do you realize Moses is saying to God, in choosing me, you don't know what you're doing. Now think about that for a minute. In choosing me, you don't know what you're doing because I'm really not up to do what you chose me to do. Now what does that say about God and his knowledge of us? All these excuses then were excuses were given to cover up that fact. Moses didn't want to go. Now that the smoke screen is removed, here's an interesting thing that happens. And this is the first and only time it happened with Moses. That is God dealing with Moses. God's patience is over with, as we would say it today, with Moses. And it becomes very evident. When you look at the comments, in other words... God has said enough's enough. If you look at Exodus 4 and verse 14, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth and thou shalt be to him instead of God and thou shalt take this rod in thy hand wherewith thou shalt do signs. Now notice, God approached him and said, I want you to do this. All this, these excuses are offered as a smoke screen because you really didn't want to go. Did it change God? Go through, and I won't do it now for sake of time, but go through verses 15 through 17 and give emphasis to the word shall. God says you shall do this, you shall do this, you shall do this. Then we can understand why the Lord was angry with Moses. Brethren, the same is true with us today many times. Any excuse we offer for not obeying God is only a smoke screen sent up to hide the truth that we really we just don't want to do it. Now, why we don't want to do it, I, that I don't know. Sometimes it's, you know, if I can't do it my way, I won't do it. Or frankly, I don't like some of you and I don't have to do this because it makes me associate with you. Can you imagine brethren saying, I'm so faithful to the Lord, but I, I can't work with my brethren. Well, don't worry on their judgment. You'll never have to see your brethren again, except those who are like you. We really would rather that God use someone else because we don't want to do what God called us to do and that we say in the Bible we're here to do as the elect of the earth, the children of God, the most precious of God on this earth. The anger of the Lord's kindled against those of us who are that way, and I know that because it was kindled against Moses. And once Moses saw that, from here on, he never never again makes excuses. Never again does he do this. We would say he learned his lesson. So if we've been making excuses, pattern after Moses' excuses, the only thing I can say is we need to repent. God knows what he's doing. We heard the gospel and believed it. Now, if you've heard it and believed it and haven't obeyed it, what smoke screen do you raise as to why you haven't done what you admit is the truth? Or as a member of the church, what smoke screen of excuses are you raising to try to get out of doing what you say that you're here to do? For the word Christian means of Christ. Well, regarding Moses, we know the rest of the story. He did repent and answer God's call, going on to Egypt, delivering Egypt, uh, the uh, Israel out of Egypt, the Egyptian bondage, leading them 40 years in the wilderness. Every excuse he made was because he was unwilling to do what God said. Once he became willing to do what God said, lots of things fall into line, folks. But as long as you're trying to do things your way, a lot of things don't stay out of line. But when you fully from the heart submit to his will at every calling, a lot of things you have problems with are going to line up then. But you can't go around saying, I'll do it, but I've got to do it my way. So what about us? Now we need to ask the question, what's the rest of the story with us? For we're the ones that have to make it. Surely we won't make excuses and one day suffer the wrath of God. Well, only time will tell how much time there is out there, I don't know. 
But I pray that all who really listen to this message and take it honestly to heart have realized that those who make excuses like Moses will also follow him in repentance. What about God's invitation to the people who need to become Christians to obey the gospel of Christ? Are we making excuses there? Or if you're a child of God and you've been following the example of Moses at this point, well then continue to follow his example. Resolve to do things God's way as you say you're doing by obeying the gospel and being a member of the church, a Christian, one who is off Christ. So you need to repent of your sins and confess them and pray God for forgiveness. We've studied the plan of salvation. If you need to obey the gospel, then we beg of you, we plead with you by the mercies of Christ to respond to the gospel invitation while we stand and sing.